Well, hello from the National Archives Public Programs and Education staff. My name is Missy McNatt, and I am located in the Washington, D.C. office. And welcome to our Young Learners Children's Book Program. This morning, we meet Carol Boston Weatherford, author, poet, and professor. Ms. Weatherford has been hailed by the Huffington Post as a master of picture book nonfiction, and she's a Newbery Honor author, a New York Times bestseller, and two-time NAACP Image Award winner. And since her 1995 debut, she has published more than 60 books, including these Caldecott Honor winners. Freedom in Congo Square, Voice of Freedom, Fannie Lou Hamer, Spirit of the Civil Rights Movement, and Moses, When Harriet Tubman Led Her People to Freedom. And six of her books have won the Coretta Scott King Awards or Honors. And today, Ms. Weatherford discusses her new picture book biography of Bayard Rustin, Bayard Rustin worked behind the scenes for the civil rights movement, including organizing the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in August of 1963, where a quarter of a million activists and demonstrators from every corner of the United States convened in the nation's capital. And it was there that they raised their voices in unison to call for racial and economic justice for all Black Americans. The National Archives hold numerous records related to the civil rights movement, including a number directly related directly to Bayard Rustin. So on this slide, in this photo, we see Bayard Rustin sitting next to President Lyndon B. Johnson. And it's a meeting with civil rights uh, leaders and others in the cabinet room. And very, very sadly, it occurred um, shortly after the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And next, we see a close up of Mr. Rustin, also taken on that same day, April 5th of 1968, um, in that same meeting. So you can find our educational activities about Bayard Rustin on our Docs Teach website, docsteach.org. And so um, here's one of them. Um, we have several activities on the website related to his work. Um, in this activity, we have the final plan for the March on Washington in August of 1963. And if you look very closely at the bottom corner of the plan, you can see a circle around Mr. Rustin name, listing him as deputy director of the march. So somebody who is absolutely essential to the march, but um, very much in the background and not as well known as others. Um, and another uh, activity, you can see the final program of the famous March on Washington. And all of these activities can be found on our Docs Teach website, docsteach.org. So when you go to Docs Teach, you can do a search and you can search for Bayard Rustin or the March on Washington to find these activities. So we will take audience questions at the end of our program. Um, so if you have you have a question for Ms. Weatherford, please enter it in the YouTube chat box. And we have a National Archives staff member who is monitoring the chat box for us today. So all of our programs are brought to you from the National Archives Public Programs and Education Team and the National Archives Foundation. Now, please join me in giving a very, very, very warm welcome to author, poet, and professor, Carol Boston Weatherford. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be participating in this program and to be focusing on the book, A Song for the Unsung. Uh, Bayard Rustin, the man behind the 1963 March on Washington. I'm doubly excited because I have done so much research over the years at the National Archives. I mean, dating back to the days when you had to go uh, to Washington and wear white gloves and look through photographs. So my research predates um, digitization. 
but I'm really, uh, I, I just really appreciate the National Archives so much and appreciate being to, able to present to you today. The first slide that I'm gonna share with you focuses on my childhood. I am a child of the 1960s. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, which largely had, in some, in some ways, had desegregated um, by the time I had reached at least the age of awareness. The first slide shows um, two um, amusement parks. That's me in the upper left-hand corner at about age 10 years old. Uh, the two amusement parks that you see on the left are Enchanted Forest at the top, which is where my mother took me. It was a storybook theme park, not like nothing like the theme parks of today. Much it's now a farm where kids can go and see the and pick pick stuff and pick you know pick produce and um, and see the uh, the old uh, storybook carrot storybook sculptures. But the amusement park at the bottom, New Gwyn Oak Park, was an amusement park that I didn't get to until I was older because it had it was it was segregated. Integrated in 1960, uh, but I'm a, I think my parents were still upset that it had been segregated, so I didn't get there until about 1966 or 68. Uh, so my parents were still holding the grudge um, about segregation for many years after. I can remember news events from the 1960s. Uh, the March on Washington is, is really one of the is really the first news event that I can remember uh, being televised, other than. Um, the, the launching of rockets during the space race that was going on at the time. Uh, so I can remember the March on Washington. I did not attend, but I did watch it all day with my mom. And I can also remember um, the uh, assassination of uh, President Kennedy. I can remember being out of school uh, during that time period. And I can remember the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And of course, being out of school for that as well as uh, Baltimore and other cities. Uh, erupted uh, into to riots. On the next slide, um, I focus on two poems that influenced me uh, as, a, as a girl um, and raised my consciousness. The first poem um, that touched me um, and, and raised my consciousness about not only the civil rights movement, but about um, conditions that African-Americans had faced, not just in the 60s, but many years prior in the United States, is, is Langston Hughes's poem, I Too. In fourth grade, we had to memorize that poem. Uh, and then in eighth grade, during a, a study of the Harlem Renaissance, I was exposed to another poem, a poem by County Cullen entitled Incident. And it is about a boy who visited my hometown of Baltimore and was uh, and met a uh, a white boy about the same age and the white boy called him the N-word. And of all the things that happened to him during his trip to Baltimore, that's all that the little boy, little black boy could remember. And so I, those poems really resonated, both of those poems really resonated with me and raised my consciousness um, uh, as I was coming of age. Another thing that you need to know about me uh, is that I was raised by two grandmothers. I had, my parents were in the household, but there was always a grandmother in the house. And the next slide shows those two grandmothers. My uh, grandmother uh, on the left, I called Mama Boston. And on the right was Mama Annie. And in the center, you see me with my parents and my grandfather, Reverend Lund P. Whitten. He was a Methodist minister. So my being exposed to my grandmothers and uh, having that, having inherited the legacy of my grandfather, I appreciated oral traditions, um, storytelling uh, traditions, um, folklore, um, sayings, uh, you know, from proverbs to old wives' tales. My grandmother's uh, uh, new recipes by heart. They quilted, which for me is is both a a fiber art, but also oral traditions kind of get passed down through quilts because they tell stories. And if you look at the quilts and see the clothes that, and can remember the clothes that those fabric pieces of fabric came from, that the quilts tell a story, you know, whether they're intentionally story quilts or not. So I, I had a very, um, I grew up in a very language rich environment where uh, culture and customs were passed down from generation to generation. And that has influenced my mission 
as an author, which you will see on the next slide. My mission as an author is to mine the past for family stories, fading traditions, and forgotten struggles that center Black resistance, resilience, remarkability, rejoicing, and remembrance. And so uh, what that means is that uh, I, I translate that in many different ways. Um, and you'll see on the next slide um, how that mission manifests itself in my work. I write hybrid genre work. I mix poetry with biography, nonfiction, and historical fiction. Um, my work is known for inventive and evocative lyrics that reveal hidden history. As I said, I'm inspired by oral traditions. I mentioned recipes and proverbs, but also I'm influenced by spirituals and the blues, protest songs, uh, sermons, um, and the way people talk, the vernacular. I integrate primary sources and I also sample, not song lyrics as it says there, but song lyrics uh, into my work whenever I can. Some recurring themes that uh, I'm known for are uh, besides uh, segregation and civil rights and social justice movements are music, sports, and photography. Uh, my books invite uh, and poems invite study across the curriculum and I'm pretty prolific. If you blink, you might miss one of my titles and I personally have lost count of how many books I have, but it's more than 60. Uh, and the next slide shows uh, some, of my, some of my books. I am known for writing biographies. I've written biographies of several famous people. Harriet Tubman was one of my uh, early heroes. I've written about Oprah Winfrey, uh, at least, uh, at least her, the first six years of her life in, in the partial biography, Oprah the Little Speaker. I've written about uh, President Obama, about Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul, and about Martin Luther King, uh, just to name a few of the more famous figures that I have written about. However, the next slide shows that I also write about hidden figures, unsung heroes, forgotten heroes. And that's really an important part of my, of my mission to spotlight people who, um, who are in danger of fading into obscurity. People like Arturo Schomburg, the man behind uh, the Schomburg Center in New York, uh, the largest uh, repository of African-American uh, research and culture in the United States. People like Matthew Henson, who was one of the first to reach the geographic North Pole, like Fannie Lou Hamer, the voting rights activist from Mississippi, people like Wendell Scott, who was the first and only African American to win a stock car racing, uh, a stock car race. He was the first, first and only African American stock car racing champion. And people like Mary Hamilton, one of many uh, women who worked behind the scenes of the civil rights movement, women who are uh, just beginning to get their due. Uh, Call Me Miss Hamilton is uh, one of the books that I collaborated on with my son, Jeffrey Weatherford. Which brings me to uh, another uh, of, uh, recurring theme uh, in my book, uh, besides uh, social justice movements and besides profiling uh, famous and forgotten heroes. The next slide shows uh, some of my books that are about music. I really love music, uh, particularly jazz, and I uh, have written many books that uh, about uh, musical, uh, about musicians, and about songs, and about uh, musical genres like rap and jazz. So it was natural uh, for me, it was a no brainer for me when Rob Sanders came to me. My, Rob Sanders is the co -auth, my co author of A Song for the Unsung. When Rob Sanders came to me and asked if I was interested in co authoring a book, collaborating on a book about Bayard Rustin, I said yes. Um, it was an opportunity to, for me to merge not only my love for music, but also my interest in uh, the freedom struggle into one, uh, one book. So I'm going to read um, a few uh, pages from A Song for the Unsung and we'll advance to the next slide and you can read along with me. That is the cover. The book is illustrated by Brian McRae, uh, who uh, is a new talent. I think this is his debut, um, debut book. 
And I'm really excited for him. And I, I just love the artwork that he created uh, for the book. So if you go to the next slide, please, uh, I will read um, some excerpts from, from the book. And you'll notice that the display type on each on, on these spreads um, are song titles. Um, so that is how we uh, integrated Bayard Rustin's love for music into the text. Sing, pray on to call on the hopes of the ancestors. Born in Westchester, Pennsylvania in 1912, Bayard had the faith of his grandmother, Julia Davis Rustin. She taught young Bayard her Quaker, her Quaker values. Early on, he learned the church's teachings, including a belief in nonviolence. Bayard was also learning about the injustices that African-Americans faced. Julia supported the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. Young Bayard gave up his bed when well-known NAACP members stayed overnight in the Rustin home. He heard the grown-ups talking late into the night about the civil rights struggle. Sing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen under the burden of racism. We'll go on to the next spread. As a young man, Bayard's feelings about justice, peace, and nonviolence grew stronger and stronger. And he put his feelings about equality and pacifism into action. Sing every time I feel the spirit to keep the faith. When he refused to give up his seat on a bus, Bayard was beaten and arrested. He did not fight back. Sing traveling shoes to take a stand by sitting down. When he refused to fight in World War II or to support the war, Bayard was sent to prison for more than two years. Behind bars, he spoke up for equality, working to integrate the prison so black and white prisoners were treated equally. Sing down by the riverside to advocate for peace. Sing the gospel train along the first ever freedom ride. Once out of prison, Bayard joined another protest against segregated buses. Again, he was arrested. This time he was sentenced to a chain gang. But the harsh treatment did not change Bayard's commitment to civil rights and his dedication to peaceful protest. Next spread, please. Sing, I'm gonna sit at the welcome table to demand service. And I love that, I love that song. So I actually am gonna sing a few bars of that. Uh, that's also a song that Fannie Lou Hamer, another one of my biographical subjects sang. I'm going to sit at the welcome table. I'm going to sit at the welcome table one of these days. Hallelujah. I'm going to sit at the welcome table. Going to sit at the welcome table one of these days, one of these days. When Bayard staged a one-man sit-in at a whites-only lunch counter, he was again arrested. But jail time didn't stop him from fighting for what he knew was right. As a young black gay man, Bayard Rustin was also learning about another kind of inequality and injustice. Back then, men who loved men and women who loved women could not socialize together. Doing so could get you arrested. Bayard knew that firsthand. And revealing that you were gay could mean losing your job, your friends, or even your family. Bayard's family stood by him, but being gay threatened his civil rights mission. Some of African-American leaders didn't want to work with him. Some white lawmakers tried to shame him. Still, Bayard kept on fighting for equality, and he did so while being nonviolent. Sing, I've been buked when society frowns on you. I've been buked and I've been scorned. Oh, I've been buked and I've been scorned. I've been buked and I've been scorned. I'm going to talk about it sure as you're born. I think I got some of the words wrong. But, um, so next slide. The next slide shows marchers with their feet um, in the water uh, in the reflecting pool. And that's one of the things that I can remember 
uh, seeing um, as the March on Washington was televised. Bayard was not used to being in the spotlight. Bayard was used to not being in the spotlight. His name had been left off important reports he had co-authored. He had been a trusted advisor to Dr. King and then had been let go. Some would have nothing to do with Bayard. After all, they must have thought, what does a gay man have to offer us or our cause? But when A. Philip Randolph was put in charge of the March on Washington, he knew immediately the man he wanted as his deputy, Bayard Rustin. Sing this little light of mine from behind the scenes. Bayard did not have time to think about any of that as the crowd of marchers arrived at the Lincoln Memorial and spilled onto, out into the mall. Bare feet dangled in the reflecting pool. People munched on box lunches. Next slide, please. Sing, we shall overcome hand in hand as folk singer Joan Baez leads the chorus of voices. Sing when the spirit says sing. Bayard had carefully composed the program for the March on Washington. Each song, each speaker, the speakers inspired, the singers performed, the crowd listened and cheered, clapped and chanted. Music had always been at the center of Bayard's life. Songs from church, songs sung with the college quartet, songs he wrote, sang, and recorded, prison songs and chain gang songs, the songs of the countries he visited, the songs of the people he met, songs of peace, songs of protest. Next slide, please. The 2,500 marchers left that day committed to work, vote, and protest nonviolently for civil rights. Thousands of reporters, photographers, and other members of the media shared the story of the peaceful, peaceful march with America and the world. The monumental march led to the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That law ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination. A quiet man orchestrated it all, a man behind a movement, an unsung hero, a gay African-American, Bayard Rustin, finally a song for you. Sing, ain't that good news when the day is finally done. And so that is, uh, those, that, that is an excerpt from a song for the unsung. Uh, we can stop showing the slides now. And I'll talk just a little bit about the back matter because the back matter is, is quite rich. Um, in addition to um, a brief biography, uh, just two paragraph biography of Bayard Rustin uh, that appears in the back matter, um, there's also a timeline. Bayard Rustin was born in 1912 and died in 1987. There, we also show uh, the uh, official program for the March on Washington that was referenced earlier uh, during this program and is uh, among the holdings of the National Archives. And we talk about the history of, peace, of peaceful protest and the influence of Mohandas Gandhi on, uh, on Bayard Rustin and how Bayard Rustin passed on uh, that philosophy to uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King during the Montgomery bus boycott. And we also have a section in the back matter that talks about the music behind the movement and how important protest songs were to sustaining not only the protest, but also sustaining the protesters, particularly when they were jailed. And we have the text of the uh, song, uh, We Shall Overcome, at least the first verse of it, uh, as part of the back matter, and the 10 demands of the March on Washington for jobs uh, and freedom. And I will read just a couple of those uh, demands. And of course, we know that the demands were met by the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act. The first demand, comprehensive and effective civil rights legislation from the present Congress without compromise or filibuster to guarantee all Americans access to all public accommodations, decent housing, adequate and integrated education, 
and the right to vote. Withholding of federal funds from all programs in which discrimination exists. Enforcement of the 14th Amendment. Reducing congressional representation of states where citizens are disenfranchised, disfranchised. And I skipped one, and it's probably one of the most important ones for children, desegregation of all school districts in 1963. And there are 10 demands, and you can read about, read more about those um, in the text of the book and, and also in the archives, in, in, the, uh, uh, on the, in the program uh, that the National Archives holds of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And we also have a biography, uh, a, bi a bibliography that includes not only books that children can read to learn more about the civil rights movement, but also uh, books that we, we consulted, that Rob Sanders and I consulted to do our research. So I'm gonna turn it back over to, um, to uh, Missy and uh, for some questions. I'm waiting for Missy, Missy McNatt. Well, I'll continue, I'll continue talking about um, the book then. Um, there, I, I love um, African-American spirituals and it was really a treat for me to be able to integrate uh, so many uh, into, into this book. Um, one of my favorites, um, I can remember when I played piano, I could play Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Um, this Little Light of Mine, I learned as a little girl in Sunday school I love um, Down by the Riverside, as well as Ain't, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Round. When I've Done the Best I Can, I believe was one of my grandfather's uh, favorite, favorite songs. And many of us know uh, When the Saints Go Marching In. Uh, so those are some of the, some of the spirituals that, you, that are integrated, at least the titles of the spirit, spirituals that are integrated and referenced, invoked uh, in the text of a song for the unsung. So I'm hoping that Missy will- I, I, I think I'm us. unmuted now. Um, I'm having some issues with, it was like my computer was frozen for a oh, minute. No problem. Um, so I think I'm, I'm back and uh, I, I'm not sure we're gonna get the video back, but that's fine. So thank you so much. Um, Ms. Rutherford, for your presentation, it was it was it's excellent. And and the first thing I'd like to say is that um, I was mispronouncing um, the name. It's Bayard. I think I was saying Bayard. So my apologies for that. Um, but thank you. Um, and also, we have some folks here um, from Willow Spring, North Carolina, who are watching. So if anyone else from across the country would like to write where you're watching from, we will call it out. Um, we have a, a few questions for you. And the first one is, um, were the, in doing your research in all of your books, or, you know, the one particularly about um, Mr. Rustin, was there any, were there any su surprises, anything that has surprised you um, in, in the course of writing this book or any of the books that you have written um, going back to the 1990s? Well, I didn't, I didn't know an awful lot about, by, about Bayard Rustin when I um, embarked on this prog uh, project with uh, Rob Sanders. So, I mean, it, it surprised me, you know, the, the, the degree of homophobia that existed um, within the movement and, in, and, and of course in society at that time and how, how risky it was to, you know, for a gay man to, to be himself or for a gay, for a gay woman uh, uh, to be herself at that time. So, um, you know, the fact that uh, the work, his work was so essential to the movement, yet he, at, at various times, he was ostracized from the movement, it was just very, very sad to me um, and, and somewhat, somewhat surprising that, you know, we, we couldn't see that, um, that LGBTQ plus people, which that wasn't even a term then, um, need, deserved equal rights as well. So that was that was somewhat surprising and, and very and very sad to me the, the degree of persecution that out gay people um, ha had to endure at that time. 
Yeah, and as you pointed out, so Mr. Rustin was facing these double prejudices and uh, throughout his life in so many ways. And, and perhaps, you know, one of the reasons that he was more interested in saying more in the background, but you know, he, as you also said, he was an amazing organizer. So um, he did, you pointed out that he loved to sing. Were there ever any recordings of any of his uh, songs? Yes, there is, a, there is a recording. And let me see if we have that in the, in the back matter. I don't think we have, we may or may not. Let me check. Now, I don't see the, I don't see the recording in here, but there is a recording. And I think you may be able to hear some of that on YouTube. Okay, so perhaps yeah. people can can check it out there. So, um, and then another question in all of your research, you know, as you've researched so many different people over the years, was anybody has become a bit of a favorite for you? <laughs> well, I probably already had a favorite um, before I embarked on this career, and that would be Billie Holiday because she's my muse. And so I have I have a book called Becoming Billie Holiday, and of course her. Her connection to the civil rights movement is, is through the song Strange Fruit, um, an anti-lynching hymn, um, which I'm sure that Bayard Rustin listened to. It was, you know, he was a, one, a her contemporary, and so I'm sure he knew that knew that song. Um, so yeah, that that was she was one, and I, I mentioned um, the fact that Harriet Tubman was one of my early early heroes. Uh, I grew up in Maryland, and Harriet Tubman was a Marylander. I have ties to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, as as and which is where Harriet Tubman hailed from, and so she was one of my early heroes, and I, I feel an affinity uh, for her as well. Yeah, they're both amazing, amazing people. So that's great. And do you, you also wrote a book about Matthew Henson, and um, I'm going to mention just at the very end that we um, have are having a program. Um, the next program is in fact about Matthew. We have a Matthew Henson reenactor. Oh, wow. So that's uh, yes, um, and there are quite a few records at the National Archives connected to him, which is it's just amazing the records we have. Um, so we are getting close to. To the end of our program, and um, we have our final question for you. Um, what advice do you, as an author and storyteller, have for our youth today? Um, I think I'm going to give some advice, kind of based on this book, um, and may, perhaps based on other books as well. And it is that demographics does not determine destiny. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you wh where you come from geographically. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what uh, ethnicity you are. We all have. We all can contribute, and we all have value. And that's that's really what I want young people to remember: that we should that we all have value. You should value yourself, but also value other other people because we all have. Uh, gifts and talents and energy that we can contribute to uh, advancing as a society. Now that's a wonderful advice and I hope that everyone out there especially our, our young people take that to heart so thank you so very much for joining us this morning and uh, look forward to reading your book um, and you know, that's just sounds like a, a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the civil rights movement and um, Mr. Rustin. So thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Um, so if we could just pull up that doc seach slide again. So this again, uh, encourage um, everyone out there to check out DocsTeach, DocsTeach.org, and again, look for this particular activity or um, do searches uh, for uh, Bayard Rustin and the Civil Rights Movement and the March on Washington. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and then our last uh, slide is for our next program, the National Archives Comes Alive Young Learners Program to meet Matthew Henson. Polar Explorer on Thursday, February 9th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thank you everyone for joining us today.